against the presenting argument that you are in favour of the government intervening in terms of the economic crisis. I think the place to start, um, because we're going to be, uh, Mark and I will be uh, debating for the next 90 minutes, and you'll be asking us questions. Um, I just want to paint a few brush strokes about why I hold the views I do. And um, there'll be recurring themes as we discuss the particular kind of shocks and crises that I, um, uh, as you hear me, um, you know what my reference points are. Um, first thing to say, um, and uh, is that I mean, there is um, no doubting the uh, dynamic power of capitalism, its capacity to embrace innovation, and its congruence uh, with entrepreneurship. Uh, and uh, I am a Keynesian, uh, but that doesn't mean that I don't recognize uh, the power of capitalism. And uh, whether it be the, the great general purpose technologies, nearly 30 of them, that over uh, the millennia have been the real kind of drivers uh, of wealth, you know, from the wheel to the computer via the three mastered sailing ship, it has been, can't, you can't describe that process without recognizing the role of capitalist enterprise, risk taking, uh, and actually um, the capacity of individual men and women to try and capture that innovativeness. But here's the point. Uh, uh, I'm not a utopian. And uh, Mark is. Um, I don't believe um, that the economics that attempts to describe the dynamics of capitalism, uh, which you'll be learning if you come to Cambridge, actually gets it right. Uh, and the, the, the building blocks uh, of economics um, rest on three or four assumptions which I contest. And when you hear me contesting them, I think you recognize that the world I'm trying to paint is the world of lived reality uh, and not um, the abstruse abstractions on which kind of orthodox economic theory is constructed. Uh, the first kind of, my first challenge is that um, uh, those fantastic innovations which have been driving kind of so much prosperity over the millennia uh, welcome us into a world of radical uncertainty. We simply do not know uh, what is going to happen. I do not know, speaking to you now, there will be war in Europe. I don't know uh, whether the Conservative Party is about to implode there will be a general election before Christmas, which is a possibility. Uh, I don't know I, and I don't know uh, how the financial markets might react if next week um, the British Prime Minister sacks his Chancellor. Uh, we live in a world of radical uncertainty. Uh, and this radical uncertainty imparts to the motion capitalism not the equilibria and the drive to uh, a point of balance, which is the, settled, uh, the, 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 the imagined settled posture of a capitalist economy as imagined by free market economists like Mark. The way I see it is the capitalist economy, beset by radical uncertainty, is always on the move, is always in a mode of disequilibria, and people are always trying to figure out what the hell is going to happen in the next time period and the, and the next time period beyond that. That's the first substantive difference between Mark and me, because we both recognize the kind of genius of capitalism. The second uh, departure uh, that I have with Mark, it flows from um, this uh, belief of mine that there is radical uncertainty, that is the world. The second thing that uh, uh, frames my thinking, <coughs> and this is, I hope you'll recognize, is that there is um, not just good and bad luck, but good luck that you don't deserve, and bad luck that you don't deserve. And these uncertainties uh, that can rock our economy and move it from disequilibrium can find uh, firms, individuals, uh, organizations, the kind of wrong side of the situation, not for any action that they took themselves. They serve from undeserved, brute, bad luck. Uh, some of you um, may have been born to disadvantaged parents. Uh, others in this room, I'm guessing, have not. 
but the brute good luck of coming out of the right loins uh, can affect your entire life chances. And uh, any good society has to take care of brute good luck and brute bad luck. And try and design that out as far as possible. And not let individuals suffer the consequences uh, of actions for which they have no responsibility or could not be expected to. Uh, the next thing is, uh, is that uh, individuals, and you'll in the textbooks, are deemed to be capable of rationally responding to price signals in markets, uh, which will signal what their course of action should be. Should they continue uh, in a particular place of work? Should they buy more of whatever? Should they sell it? Should they, uh, that you are, and that the hidden hand of the market um, will guide our actions, um, driven by self-interest, responding to these price signals in markets to produce the best outcomes. Well, first of all, if there is radical uncertainty, one's capacity to do that is pretty limited. Uh, actually, human beings are much more complicated than just prosecutors of self-interest. At the moment, and we'll discuss this, I'm sure, in the course of the morning, uh, I'm worried about climate change. And I'm worried about the impact of, as, as the world population goes to 9 billion, of the pressure on resources and how we're going to manage that. Uh, that is, front and foremost, one of, one of the things that kind of drives my behaviours. I, I invest in shares. I want the companies in which I'm invested to take care of that preoccupation. I'm not anxious that they should maximise shareholder value, their immediate financial interest. I want them to maximise or trade off that preoccupation with something else. I'm, a com I'm complicated. I think a number of perhaps mutually exclusive things at the same time. I'm a human being. Economics, uh, imagining that that's not the case, consistently gets the behaviour of markets and capitalists and economic agents and banks and whoever wrong. And lastly, and fundamentally, fundamentally, Marx economics uh, is based on the behaviour of rational economic women, economic men, fully responding to price signals in markets and arriving at best outcomes. It's an emphasis on the I. I recognise the, the importance of individual responsibility and I recognise the power of individual agency. But there is also the we. There is also the we. You are human beings. Uh, you live in society. You uh, are members of social organisations. Uh, you relate to one another. You care about one another, each other think. And actually there are gains from cooperating in groups that economics doesn't really attempt to capture. So there's four things. And this is on the we, designing out group bad luck, radical economic uncertainty, and the complexity of human impulse means that markets cannot behave arriving at perfect outcomes left to their own devices. There has to be, as Keynes said, a deus ex machina that actually um, will step in and course correct markets when they go wrong and when they uh, get to extreme shocks of the financial crisis, do what they did uh, in the financial crisis in 2008-2009. That, and my entire thinking is not to deny some of the kind of impressive persuasive things that Mark will say about capitalism. I begin this debate by conceiving it. My charge is that he is a utopian. My charge is he doesn't really live in the real world. My charge is he neglects the we. My charge is, is that what we should be doing, citizens of this country, particularly now, at this moment of national affairs, is actually trying to build institutions that blend, that blend uh, the best of the I with the best of the we. And occasionally, we succeed in doing it in Britain. Uh, the state creates an institution like the BBC or the National Health Service, which actually does do that. And I regard those as uh, pillars of our, of our civilization and actually important contributions to economic prosperity. There's not time, I'm running out, I have about a minute left, a maximum. But um, uh, over the course of the next hour and a quarter, I'm hoping to explain um, uh, that framework and how it works in some... You can imagine a crisis in which you might think that markets and voluntary exchange and free and women can't atomistically solve the problem. And I've given you the example of a, of a nuclear strike, for example. My worry at the outset is the word crisis is becoming devalued in currency terms. 
We seem to be in a almost polarized state of crisis. I can't think of a year in my adult life where we haven't had some crisis to deal with um, of, one, of one form or the other. You don't have to go that, that far to the global financial crisis. We've now got the COVID crisis. Uh, the challenges of climate change have now extended beyond a crisis. That's now an emergency, which I take to be a kind of premier league of crisis. There's an obesity crisis, there's a loneliness crisis, there's a demographic crisis, there's an immigration crisis. Crisis seems to actually mean a sort of normal state of affairs where there are problems that we are facing. And I think we've got to be a bit more honed on what we actually think a crisis is that only um, government action can deal with. Because I think a good number of these things can be much better dealt with by the market. But let me take up some of the points that Will made, because I don't agree, I don't disagree with some of his premises. The, the world is a, an enormously uncertain place. That for sure is true. Uh, like Will, I don't know whether the Chancellor of the Exchequer will, will be fired next week, whether there'll be a general election. I don't know what the exchange rate of the pounds of the US dollar will be. I don't know uh, what will happen in Ukraine. And there's probably a million other potential problems that didn't cross my mind. The world is, is an extraordinarily uncertain place. That is not a doubt. I think a lot of Will's arguments were not against me, they were against the textbooks. I, don't, I believe that there is a permanent discovery process, permanently trying to find the best way out of these problems. We don't, as the economic textbooks will tell you, suddenly reach an equilibrium where there is a prevailing market price on something and we're all agreed that the price of a banana should be 18p in this perfect competition. There's a permanent, permanent discovery process with more information coming in all of the time, contestable information uh, all of the time, and although I believe that the best judge of your interests is you, I don't believe you're a perfect judge of them. And I don't believe that you are necessarily motivated only by self-interest and what benefits you. I think you could, well be, you could well be motivated by altruism, how what you might do impacts on your family, your community, the world, the climate in general. So I think a lot of those complaints were about textbook economics, not libertarian economics. Uh, and what he segues quite, um, Elegantly, if I may say so, but, um, but I think it's a little bit of a card trick here into is to assume that because markets won't solve these problems optimally, that the state is the solution to doing something optimally. It might be that there are problems that we can't possibly solve, but you can't leap from that to assume that politicians and bureaucrats won't necessarily make them worse. I'm not saying that they will in all circumstances, I'm saying they might in some. Um, and I would say our experience of uh, recent crises, be that COVID-19, be that looking back to the uh, global financial crisis, is you'll notice the following sort of things uh, amongst uh, governments and government agencies, and I'm not accusing any of them of being maligned. I'm assuming, for the sake of argument, that these people are well-intentioned, honest, and in no way corrupt and trying to do the best they can. But there, there, there seems to be a few takes uh, that, you could, that you could observe here. One is, they tend to greatly overstate their knowledge about a particular problem. And I would say this has been true with COVID-19. I'm not saying COVID-19 is not a problem. I'm saying that they seem to think that they know more about how it's going to pan out than is actually knowable. They tend to overstate the size of the problem, generally. Uh, I think that's been a common thread. And it, uh, I, I can't think, I might be wrong, but I can't think of a, of a government or a government advisor report on COVID-19, which is understated the number of uh, deaths, hospitalizations, or other problems. Most of the predictions have been uh, on the very high end, indeed, enormously overstating the problem. So they, they overstate how much they think they know, they overstate the size of the problem. They understate uh, how much individual men and women and voluntary exchange and free conduct can actually react to a, uh, a major problem. Uh, I, I feel a bit sorry for some of the scientists involved in the latest crisis because some of their numbers will be picked out and used as a headline, but if you look into the density of the text, they'll say, but this is assuming that there's no voluntary change on human behavior, those sorts of things. But of course, there is an enormous change in voluntary behavior. Without any state mandates whatsoever, individual men and women would have changed their behavior as more and more information about COVID-19 became available. As it became, for example, more and more obvious that it was um, particularly harmful to older people rather than younger people, that would have led for older people to have changed their behavior and be more cautious, perhaps for younger people to feel that they don't need to wear a face mask, that they can go down the pub, that there aren't the same sort of risks to them. So I think actually the private sector is is pretty adaptable. And finally, the, the government tends to, and the state tends to underestimate the negative side effects of what they're doing. In other words, they're not really good at trade-offs, even if some of their actions 
help and solve the problem, they often, uh, they often cause many, many more. So I'm worried that we have rather too many crises that we'll look at a problem and call it a crisis or look at a crisis and call it an emergency. I'm concerned that we enormously overstate just because something must be done, that state agencies are necessarily the best way of doing it. I think there is an enormous uh, uh, set of data to suggest exactly the same. I think we're falling for what the great economist Friedrich Hayek called the fatal conceit. Just because there is a problem out there doesn't mean that your uh, government agencies can brilliantly solve it. They may indeed make it far worse. So ultimately, even though I come from a free market libertarian think tank, there is in one way, actually, that I am a Marxist. Uh, not Karl Marx, I have to say, but Groucho Marx, whose observation was that politics appears to be the business of looking for trouble, finding it everywhere, misdiagnosing it, and applying the wrong remedies. And my uh, assertion throughout this uh, debate this morning is not going to be that the private sector and individual men and women get everything right perfectly all of the time because they're perfectly informed and totally rational and if only they acted in a self-interest way, everything would magically uh, happen. My assertion is individual men and women don't have enough individual power and state agencies have too much and the errors of state agencies are more egregious often than the individual errors uh, of ordinary men and women. And I'm going to finish by conceding some ground to where well, he uh, generously conceded grounds me on the, the genius of capitalism and it is markets are a very large part of what's moved the human race forward, not just making us prosperous but taking billions of people out of absolute poverty thanks to the spread of trade and markets. But I think there are two areas where you might want the government to intervene, but quite narrow areas. One is where there are clear externalities, that the market isn't properly pricing something, so it's overused in your textbooks. I think when, when I was your age, the example was, I think, a, a coal mine next to a laundrette. Uh, I'm not sure coal mines or laundrettes exist anywhere anymore, but the, the idea was the coal mine would be polluting the atmosphere, and the poor laundrette next door uh, isn't able to do its business properly because of all the pollution in the air, and the market isn't pricing the coal properly because that pollution is being emitted uh, for no charge. I think the government does have a role to intervene in markets there, and I think carbon would be a very good example of that. That if your carbon emissions are causing damage to others, and you are paying no price for your carbon emissions, then we want to correct the market so that you're paying the fair price for it. And the second is a collective action problem. That uh, if we all have to wear face masks in order to beat COVID-19, and if any one individual uh, demurs from doing so, the virus spreads, well, you can't assume that we'll get to that point by individual action. But those are narrow things, rather narrow areas of human activity. And I worry that a state that has grown to not far off 50% of GDP in terms of the way, in terms of the total amount of money it spends, nearly half of all expenditure in the UK, one that passes more rules and regulations every single year, so quite apart from the spending power, is restricting voluntary exchange, is a long, long way away from the best model for solving problems, crises, or emergencies. Uh, I don't think government institutions are particularly well equipped to solve those things. They try to solve far too many of them. And a greater role for voluntary exchange would provide us with better outcomes. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mark. We're now going to come on to the first of several sub questions. If you do want to respond to anything, we'll do that today in the time in this section. The first sub question is. Do you think the government responded correctly to a global financial crisis and you then pulled back austerity then when you think austerity was necessary? And you have five minutes each, and uh, I'd love to cut you off if you go five minutes. In 2008, uh, there were about 10 days towards the back end of the beginning of October, where it looked as though the, not just the British, but the American, and indeed the Western financial system was uh, on the verge of collapse. Um, it was a time in four minutes and 45 seconds that now remains to me uh, to explain why uh, that happened. Uh, essentially, uh, brutally, uh, bank balance sheets had um, swollen uh, vastly beyond um, the capital that they had to kind of underwrite the risk of having to declare that some of their only was imperfect or had to be written off. And that lending had exploded to absurd levels um, because the banks imagined they'd invented devices following the precepts of free market economics um, that actually meant they could collectively insure against risk 
and they couldn't. Um, the state simply had to act. And uh, I think the actions that the British government took in that period, led by Gordon Brown, um, were um, pretty damn good, Brisbane. Um, they provided the banks with capital that the private markets would not provide them at that moment of crisis. Um, they guaranteed um, us, the savers in banks, that our deposits um, would not evaporate. Uh, and that's great to stampede on the banks. Um, we did see um, the, the first hundred uh, years people queuing to get their savings out of the British Building Society in Northern Rock. Um, you know, bank stampedes, bank collapses happen in other countries, but not here, surely. Um, and I remember being in contact um, with Treasury and Bank of England officials over that weekend, um, not actually taking the aggressive action to do anything to say to the savings of Northern Rock, your savings are cast on and safe. But they came up at uh, 8.30 on the Monday morning with an imperfect, uh, they were savings are partially safe. Uh, by the close of play on that Monday, they actually had to make the guarantee that I tried to explain over that weekend they should make. That's history. Um, at most like this, uh, unless you have um, that deus ex machina, that, uh, that the, the state acting as the we, and actually in Mark's remarks, you would have heard him downplay the we, it's always about individuals discovering and giving them voluntary, empowering them voluntarily to discover better. Uh, he never, or rarely, or in limited ways, talks about the we. And human beings are both individuals and members of groups. And at moments of a crisis like that, the we had to act. And it did. And it acted in America, it acted internationally, it acted in a coordinated way. Uh, the G20 uh, uh, behaved in the same way. Uh, and we drew back from the brink. Uh, in Britain, uh, something like a trillion pounds worth of equity investment in banks, guarantees to the uh, to bank deposits, uh, and state loans kind of were exercised to save the banking system. What happened subsequently was, I think, one of the great disgraces in, in modern economic history. Uh, the conservative politicians, notably George Osborne uh, and David Cameron, tried to say that this was the fault, of, that the whole crisis was the fault of the state, and that actually the ensuing recession um, was the fault of the state. And, they, and the ballooning budget deficit and debt, which rose to 10% of the GDP, Annual, the annual deficit to 2009 10 was 10% of the GDP. But actually, this was all the fault of the state rather than the state reacting to what had been thrown at it and launched a program of austerity. Certainly, uh, by the state was overextended. But as conservative politicians, they decided that the lion's share, 98% of the burden of adjustment, should take place by cutting public expenditure. Local government in some of the most deprived areas of this country suffered cumulatively by 2019 a 31% cuts in the, uh, in, the, in the budgets outside the education budget uh, for uh, their activities. One of the proximate causes, and now my last sentence, of the, result, of the uh, referendum result in 2016 was people at the root end, particularly around our coastal communities and in and our kind of deprived of, uh, districts in the Midlands and the North, voting against status quo, which had been incorrectly imposed on them. Uh, so in that sense, the state got things badly wrong, but it was a state directed by conservative politicians who refused to spread the burden of adjustment on raising taxes and on cutting expenditure. Uh, well, yeah, my point of agreement with Will is that in the sorry state of affairs we found ourselves in in 2008 or 2009, for uh, a fleeting while, I think would have uh, would have raised to my bar of the government needs to do something. I disagree with the prevailing conventional wisdom that the problem here was that banking in general had become a kind of wild west, wholly unregulated, devil take behind most sort of people playing Russian roulette or casino gambling in the city of London. I tried just after 2008. I quickly realised it was a fool's errand, but. I tried to go through the different sectors of the British economy, I'm only speaking for the UK here, and work out which are the most tightly regulated sectors and which are the least regulated sectors and where banking and financial services on that spectrum. 
Now, it's a fool's errand, really. It's much harder than working out where something like a tax burden lies, because what are you doing? Are you counting the total number of regulations? Are you trying to work out the burden of those regulations on a business? Are you trying to work out how severely enforced they are, what the penalty is for breach, or the rest of it? So it becomes a, a slight uh, back of an envelope calculation, but nevertheless, I attempted to do it. Uh, and uh, I discovered that the most regulated sector in the British economy uh, was if you work in the field of handling weapons grade plutonium. Uh, now, even for a free market libertarian like myself, I suspect that there should probably be some rules and regulations around the handling of weapons grade plutonium. That is pretty dangerous stuff, and you would expect that industry to be pretty tightly regulated. Banks, however, and financial services in, in general, I think probably came second after the handling of nuclear materials. Back in 1980, uh, there was one uh, state regulator for every 300 people who worked in financial services. By the time of the global financial crisis, they had increased to one state regulator for every 30. No longer one for every 300, one for every 30. Uh, and the regulatory burden, the rules that you must comply by, by, by state diktat, had also grown enormously. This was a much more regulated industry than it had been in the 1980s, both in terms of the number of enforcers and the number of rules. And in fact, halfway were to continue on the number of regulators compared to the number of people who work in financial services. By 2060, 2060, there would be one regulator for every single individual who works in financial services. Literally, the cashier at a bank would be able to have a regulator standing over their shoulder, looking at them as they did all of their activity. So I don't accept that it was a Wild West, capitalist devil take the hindmost type uh, situation. Uh, it's sort of a very, very, very badly regulated part of the economy. But I do agree with Will, you couldn't just shrug your shoulders and let the entirety of, uh, of our economic system collapse. The deposit guarantee had obviously long been there. I mean, we might have a problem that the Conservatives didn't shout from the rooftops or put that to the top line in their press room, but they didn't have to bring in the deposit guarantee. Uh, that was there. Um, uh, and then I think our longer term response uh, has been pitiful. I don't know if I agree with Will that it's the most outrageous example in recent British economic history. But I think we learned the wrong lesson that uh, politicians on all sides decided that what we needed to do from here was to make sure in the future that banks were safer. Uh, and so we would bring in rules, splitting and green fencing and having firewalls between their retail operations and their corporate banking operations. Banks must be made safer. More regulation to make banks safer. And I think that's the wrong strategy. I think our strategy should have been to make bank failure safer. I, that when a bank goes to a wall, we don't have Western capitalism about to top all like a deck of cards. We might regret a bank going to a wall, but it would be like Debenhams going bust or Woolworths going bust. They are more complicated uh, uh, businesses than a retail store, but bank failure should be just as normal as any other business failure. Unfortunately, what we've done is to say, no, 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 we've got to make sure there are rules and rules in place to stop these businesses failing. And as for austerity, I mean, I think that the, the, the label was idiotically selected by George Osborne. I don't know any politician who said, and my great place to the British electorate is I'm going to usher in an age of austerity for all of you. Uh, but he didn't even do it. Uh, I think that when there is a shock, whoever's fault it is, and Will and I might disagree about that, the fact of the matter was there was an enormous downtick in GDP. And the UK government had been spending beyond its means already for seven years, not following the diktat of Keynes of saving the good times, so you've got a pot of money for the bad times. We haven't managed a budget surplus since 2001. As I say, we seem to be permanently in the bad times these days. Uh, but if GDP falls, you would expect that the public sector has to be trimmed in order to cope with that. And these were not colossal cuts over, the, over the, that five-year period. I think the, the real terms cuts were, were like right, about 1% per annum. And you might argue about whether they fell in the wrong places. Uh, I mean, local government was slashed drastically. Other parts of government expenditure were not, were not touched at all. But that seems to be a rational response to GDP falling. We're going to cut public expenditure in real terms by 1% per annum. From the screenings from the public sector, you would have thought that they were being abolished. It was only 1% cut per year. So I think that was a, a sensible adjustment. But we learned the wrong lessons. The lesson of the global financial crash is not make banks safe, it's make bank failure safe. And we haven't done that at all. Okay, we'll leave now to to that. You may want to discuss um, whether you think that uh, it's okay to raise national debt to tackle crisis. And do you think high national debt is a problem? Um. You know, in my own remarks, I discussed a week. Uh, the British state um, will be here long after we're all dead. Um, and one of the great things that uh, that means that when you're discussing public finances, um, that kind of the, 
It's a, a pretense to think, wrong to think, uh, wrong to make an analogy, but it's like a household. Um, your mother and fathers will have mortgages, they'll last for 15, 20, 25 years, but they know they're mortal, and they know that they'll reach in their working life, and they'll have to have paid off their mortgage. That's not the story for the state. The state will be here in 250, 300 years' time. Uh, we'll discuss this a bit when we come to uh, uh, debt and, and the pandemic. Um, consequently, um, when you have shocks like um, uh, the Second World War or a, a financial crisis, it is right for the state to incur debt uh, to manage the we through that crisis and for that debt to be extremely long term. It, the debt could be 100 years. Uh, it could even be, if you want, uh, non repayable. Uh, just carry on paying interest on this debt in perpetuity. Um, that's what the state could do. And the state's right to do it uh, at certain moments when these shocks come uh, that no one expected because we live in an era of radical uncertainty. So uh, I, I didn't believe uh, that the national debt at that time, 2008 9, was so high that it required the speed uh, with which um, the deficit was attempted to be It ended up being self defeating, by the way. Uh, because the initial round of cuts were so severe that the economy didn't recover, tax revenues fell away, and actually you had to ease the austerity process because it had become self defeating. Um, I actually thought that the adjustment should be uh, has to be placed plain here. You know, um, you know um, Mark's right. Uh, you can't run public you can't run public finances so you're a permanent deficit, always loading debt, debt, debt. The point about it is that you you exercise judiciously the moment to get the national debt um, to get above, let's say, 100 or 120 percent GDP. It can be, uh, and over our history, the national debt has been considerably higher. Um, the Bank of England was invented in 1694 um, to actually manage our debt. Uh, and actually, Louis XIV was amazed that a country as small as England, which only had 500 people, could keep beating it in the wars of the America of the Spanish succession, winning the battles of Blenheim and defeating Louis XIV. How did this tiny, bloody country that actually he'd be, he'd be laying out money to Charles II, how did it beat France? And the reason was that the Bank of England was issuing debt, enabling to put uh, English armies in the field with our allies to beat the French, laying the foundations of the British Empire. Debt has been a phenomenally useful tool. And uh, we've only just finished on paying off of war debt. Um, we shouldn't be thinking about having long-term debt. We shouldn't have been freaked by it. We certainly should have done the self-damage to our basic elements of our society, uh, the, the way we ask the disadvantaged to live in our poorer parts of the country. What happened to the criminal justice system? What happened to legal aid? Um, what happened in our prisons where conditions are unbelievably um, uh, ghastly? Um, we've left all, all these elements of civilized society were barbarized to keep the national debt apparently low, genuflecting to uh, economics that was fundamentally wrong and neglecting lessons from our own history. So I was very against George Osborne and David Cameron's austerity. And I think one of the reasons, we'll come to this in a minute, one of the reasons why we're in the fix we're in. Uh, as a national community, is was a series of mistakes in which that one was central. Again, there may be somewhat um, uh, more agreement between Will and I than would appear on the surface. But uh, I'm not of the view that absolutely every year the government must balance its books and if it is a uh, terminal economic crisis or emergency, if it doesn't. I said in my opening remarks, I think the term crisis and emergency is banged around a bit too much to describe things. And I don't think that the uh, present amount of government overspend or the legacy debt uh, yet gets to a, a, a point of emergency. I am, however, extremely worried about the trajectory. Um, Will is right that you can go through a particular crisis, let's say COVID, let's say World War II, uh, let's say the backwash of the global financial crisis, and you can say, well, these truly are exceptional times. Um, a bigger expenditure by the state is going to be needed. We're going to furlough workers and we're going to need to spend more on ventilators or whatever the heck else it is. And don't worry too much about the balance sheet at the moment. You know, we, we did not beat Adolf Hitler by keeping the receipts of our credit cards and making sure that we were not overspending. We said we will spend whatever it takes to provide in this war. 
but you can't permanently be in that situation. Um, Wood is right, we agree there is radical uncertainty, I hope there isn't another war, I hope there isn't another pandemic, God knows what the major threat will be, a cyber attack, I don't know, some other problem will come along. But you can't permanently be saying, these times are extraordinary and we need to overspend them. In the times that are extraordinary, and I would put the last year or two in that category, need to be offset by other times that are good. Um, and you need to be building up a sovereign wealth fund then. I would like the government to say we're going to run surpluses. We don't know what the next crisis is going to be, but in normal times, we might not be there yet, but let's hope we are next year, we're going to run big surpluses, and we're going to put that aside so that when the next pandemic, cyber attack, war, earthquake, whatever it might be, hits, we are able to decide. No sign that that has been done by governments of either stripe over our lifetime. It has not been done at all. I consider that to be economically dangerous. I don't consider it's what Keynes would have advised. This is a kind of using Keynes to excuse um, over spending. So it might be that women and I agree on sweeping it, but then we, we've got to point to some years in the last 20 when we think surpluses should have been uh, raised, and uh, they weren't. They haven't been. 2001, the last year we balanced the books. Have we been in crisis since 2001? Well, in which case, we've got to brace ourselves for the next 20 years or so to start paying that back. Permanent crises is not the way of managing the balance sheet. And uh, I think we are in a, a difficulty here. I wouldn't get to say it's a crisis or an emergency. Because it's not just the on balance sheet debt, which I think is around about um, just south of 100% of GDP. Um, that, uh, that's high. Uh, it's not as high as when we came out of either the First World War or the Second World War, which was about 200, 250% of GDP. So if you wanted to take a, a relaxed view, crisis, what crisis, nothing to see here, you might say it's not as bad as that. However, here's the real problem that the on-balance sheet debt only tells you a small part of the picture. <coughs> if, and then Mark Will's right, the British state isn't exactly analogous to a household or a company, but if you were to compare the British state to a company, it would have to list its liabilities. It would have to list not just how much it was in debt to the bank now, but what it had promised to do on the future. If you were an insurance company or a pension company, for example, you've got liabilities. You can't just take my pension contribution and pretend that you're never going to have to pay me a pension. And if you were to include those liabilities that the British state has taken on, uh, public sector pensions being a colossal part of it, and I'm making no judgment here whether those pensions are too generous or not, I'm just saying they're big, um, the triple lock state pension, um, uh, we are going to continue to provide free healthcare at the point of use to everybody, and um, people are getting older and living longer and having more complex medical problems. Then on most estimates that I've seen, uh, the off-balance sheet uh, liabilities, which you would usually include as part of your debt, probably puts our debt up to something like 500 or 600 percent of GDP. If you are, if you wish to meet those liabilities, you could take a radical view and say, no, sorry, public sector pensions are cancelled. We're not paying out any of them. But if you're going to pay them out, you're looking at 500, 600 percent worse, in other words, than World War One or World War Two. And I would say that we are somewhere close to, if not already at it, the taxable limits of the UK economy. Uh, since the 1960s, we've had governments of all stripes, big majorities, small majorities, coalition governments, minority governments, Labour-led and Conservative-led. And no government has managed to squeeze out of the private sector more than about 39% of national income. That's about the ceiling. I would say you couldn't have a wizard wheeze to perhaps get that to 40%. But since the 1960s, virtually every balance of tax has been tried. We've had top rates of income tax of 40%, top rates of income tax of 83%, VAT all over the place. Pretty much anything that you could reasonably try has been tried. And 39% seems to be the maximum that you can squeeze out of the, set, uh, the private sector. And you might, you know, want to go lower than that. I don't think it's necessarily the role of the government to squeeze every last penny it can from the private sector. But even if you did, I would put it to you that's about 39% of GDP. Over the long run, then, that more or less sets what you can spend. It's not an absolute hard ceiling. You might be very confident about economic growth over the next 10 years. I'm not. But if you were very confident about economic growth, you could run up higher debts. But as a rough rule of thumb, 39%. I would say is about your limit over the long run. You can spend 50% this year, 47% next year, but at some point that's going to catch up with you. We're spending about, around about terms, 45% of GDP at the moment, and we haven't balanced the books for 20 years. There needs to be a correction, and there needs to be a trade-off. If you want to do more to make sure our prisons are of a higher standard, you might have to do less on funding the National Health Service, or be less generous on the triple lock pension, or have fewer police on the streets. What you can't do is to pretend that we can continue to live endlessly beyond our means. And I fear for the last 20 or 30 years we've been doing it. Not a crisis yet, but on a trajectory to one. Okay, that ends the first sub-question. We can talk about those topics in the next uh, question as well, so we can respond to that, Will. Uh, before we move on, we're going to have a quick audience poll uh, on the question, 
do you think the UK government responded correctly to global financial crisis? So please, uh, even if you're not sure, try and uh, take a side. Please raise your hand if you think the UK government did respond correctly to the global financial crisis. Yeah, the wind was too late, so yeah. there's reaction to that late night, and then there's what happened a decade after. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Re rephrase it, rephrase it, short, 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 short term, long term. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> instead, instead, we'll say, was austerity necessary for the. Okay. Yeah. Raise your hand if you think austerity was necessary. Okay, raise your hand if you think it was necessary. Wasn't necessary. Wasn't. Okay, a little bit. Uh, <laughs> uh, a little bit more in favour of it wasn't necessary, but uh, still quite a lot more support than I thought for. But it uh, was not necessary. Uh, anyway, on to the next topic, which is COVID-19. Uh, so we're going to be discussing do you think the government responded correctly to COVID-19 pandemic, and will we do this? Well, where do you begin on this? Um, Um, there's so many strands of this, I've got five minutes. Um, um, did the government act as quickly as it should have done uh, in March 2020 um, when it became clear that we were facing uh, a pandemic? And the answer is unequivocally no, it didn't. And I think that that is my universally held view. Um, that's the first point to make. Um, probably. Um, the scale of um, it, the, the scale of the lockdown uh, and the scale of the recession that followed because of the extent of the lockdown, which was the deepest recession, uh, lots of output in energy. So, so the recovery now is from the deepest depths. Um, it's testament to that. So that's a negative. Um, then you have to say that the um, that its approach to um, the uh, vaccination program has to be given a big tick. And here, um, reflecting my own remarks, I thought you saw a very good fusion of the I and the we. Um, the, um, the state cleverly, um, some of you aren't authors, but uh, one of the things that happens in publishing is that if Mark writes a book or I write a book, we get given an advance by the publisher against the royalties of the book sales. And that helps us to kind of free up time to write the book. Uh, what the government did was to give uh, a number of drug companies um, an advance against the royalties on the sales of the vaccines that they were developing. And that gave them the money to invest in vaccine production. Um, and as a result, we had uh, very quickly, we actually got um, the world's pharmaceutical companies actually focused an enormous amount of their research and their production of vaccine in this country. And that was clever public procurement, the we, the state acting cleverly, in partnership with the dynamic private sector, in particular, a company called AstraZeneca, uh, and Victor Institute in Cambridge, um, and uh, the Jenner Institute in Oxford, my university, um, uh, a, a capacity been built up by a combination of um, a kind of donors to the university and actually the state over 20 years uh, beforehand. And that's another point about the state and time. The state can do things over time that actually the private sector can't. The National Health Service rolled out that vaccine, a uh, centralised National Health Service, uh, and data on every patient in the country was able to get to us and get to us in the right order, the old people first and the uh, people who are um, uh, particularly vulnerable. And that was good. What about the insight and um, what about procurement of things like PPE um, uh, and the protection of care homes? Um, and, uh, vast amounts of money were, were squandered and lost. And here you have, uh, so I, there's not time to talk about it, but there's a phenomenon in the UK has developed which I call access capitalism. Give all the money to the donors to, get to the uh, friends of the Conservative Party, you get fast tracked. And the National Audit Office exposed the degree to which friends of ministers. Uh, and friends of MPs uh, were given contracts to make things that they have no capacity to make, squandering tens of billions of pounds, uh, uh, testing companies that actually uh, simply couldn't do the testing. Uh, and that, again, is a defamation of our system of government. 
did we, did we uh, and consistently, I think, uh, throughout this uh, crisis, uh, there's been an underestimate of, um, uh, and Mark was right here, um, we actually were taking action ahead of the government. I, I ran half a college in Oxford. Um, you know, we went for a lockdown you know, two weeks before, um, three weeks before the government. You know, it was actually obvious that actually students were getting COVID and actually couldn't conduct the, the, the college uh, as we had been doing uh, pre-COVID. We were waiting for the state to do something, and we took preemptive action ourselves. Um, Furlough, the Chancellor Sunak, and his, um, I have to say, after that um, was done well. Um, and now we are talking about the exit um, from um, the pandemic. Um, here I am very concerned. Um, I think that the, um, the government is, uh, uh, so much to say about um, monetary policy, fiscal policy, um, uh, there's an inability to learn from the success of the vaccine program. That was an industrial strategy working in microcosm in a very focused way. Uh, instead of actually thinking that's the way that we can generate, uh, um, uh, uh, use that as a model for uh, revitalizing uh, the Littles and the North as a leveling up, part of the leveling up program, which has been completely neglected. And Kwasi Kwarteng has actually abolished um, the uh, uh, industrial strategy and the National Regulatory Council and so on and so forth. So it's a mixed picture. But um, uh, there were um, the furloughing, the discovery of, and the production of um, vaccines. You have to give the state a big tip. Um, the management of the exit from this, um, the speed um, with which um, measures have been taken, too much, and too much genuflection, I would say, to the libertarian thinking on the right of the Tory party has actually meant that too frequently over the course of the crisis, the government has acted uh, too late. So there you go. Mixed picture. Uh, I agree, it's a mixed picture. My view was uh, I was sympathetic to the, to the first lockdown. Um, it might have been they should have acted a little faster. But at that uh, time, we didn't really know anything. I mean, the, the estimates about who this could affect, how badly, whether well, hospitals would be overwhelmed, how lethal was it, what sort of demographical groups was it going to be particularly uh, terrible to? I mean, just imagine if it had been, you know, absolutely catastrophic to all kids under the age of 10. I mean, it turned out that we quite greatly down. It wasn't, but it could have been the other way around. We didn't know the time. Um, however, I think the lesson that I draw from it was that, um, you know, I'm not intending to either praise or blame the individual government ministers here is central planning didn't work very well. I can remember Matt Hancock, then the health secretary, saying, we need more ventilators, right? And we're going to ask anybody in the private safe sector who can make a ventilator. We'll buy it, no matter the cost, he said. I had a discussion with my staff about whether we should convert the Institute of Economic Affairs into the Institute of Ventilation Affairs, uh, go down into the basement and start trying to make ventilators, and so on to Matt Hancock. He said, money was no object. You know, whatever price we, we cared to spend, he would buy from us whatever we managed to knock together between our toast the dishwasher and washing machine and calling it a ventilator. Uh, PPE worked very badly in Britain in terms of distribution because you had one central planner in Westminster, Matt Hancock essentially, uh, trying to work out exactly how many gloves needed to be sent to Northampton Hospital. I mean, totally symbiotized by planning things. Uh, if you were to compare and contrast this with, say, Germany, didn't really have a problem with PPE at all. Actually, a very decentralized healthcare system. Their equivalent of Northampton Hospital was working out how many clubs they got and had their own supply chains. So I think the heavily centralized uh, part of dealing with the crisis didn't work. Um, vaccination has been a, a relative success, certainly in terms of getting off the blocks fast, and I would agree with Will, it speaks to the value the private sector can uh, uh, can bring and has saved God only knows how many lives. I'm trying to start the national movement going that rather than on Thursday at 8 pm in the evening, we go on our doorstep and applaud our NHS workers. I'd like us to go out on the doorstep and applaud big pharmaceutical companies uh, for their colossal contribution to saving human life. It's been absolutely incredible. And also, I would say, is a sign of successful deregulation. We fast tracked this uh, vaccination coming through, we treated it in a different way to other medical advances, which go through a much slower, uh, longer, more tedious process. I wonder, uh, and I'm not a medical expert, but I wonder whether a lesson from this is that potential treatments for, I don't know, cancer, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, need to be brought to market potentially somewhat faster, because this COVID thing universally affected all of us. It was easy to hit the gas there. My worry about the whole government response, and it also uh, is, I mean, I couldn't say they moved the goalposts. I don't think they moved the goalposts. I think they started playing a completely new sport. 
um, I understood the objective of not overwhelming the healthcare system, sort of accepting that quite possibly all of us will get COVID, but it's extremely important we don't all get it next Tuesday because the healthcare system won't be able to cope. So we're going to have to, in terms of flatten the sombrero, we're going to have to try and slow the transmission of this virus. So even if we do all get it, we'll all get it over an 18 month period and hospitals will be able to cope. I got that, but we were clearly out of the woods on that one fairly early doors. And I do think that some of the restrictions in place for Omicron have been conservative, frankly, on the evidence we have. The evidence might not be perfect, but we now seem to have sort of almost got ourselves into a position of saying, well, you know, if we don't know, then the safe thing to do is to legally insist that everybody stays at home. I, I, I think you don't know. You, that you shouldn't be enforcing early or insistence on people staying home. It's pretty evident. I, I think we didn't look at the South African evidence readily enough from Omicron. In fact, I've got a quote here from uh, Neil Ferguson, who said he could find no evidence of Omicron having different severity to the Delta variant, despite South Africa showing that was exactly what was panning out, whether it was designed uh, first. So I think we should have exited this some considerable time ago. We overcame the problem where I think you could justify government action, making sure the healthcare system wasn't overwhelmed. The government did quite well, I think, on getting the vaccine authorised and out. And there's no further cavalry to arrive now. And I think we should have moved much more swiftly to guidance rather than enforcement. I think it's useful still to tell people, you know, uh, particularly the elderly, who are most of those with underlying conditions, what steps they may wish to take, as you would for a, a flu pandemic. Uh, but I think all legal restrictions should have ended some time ago. And uh, I think, thank God we're through the worst of this, but I think it needn't have been as protracted and painful as it has been. Okay, thank you. We've got about half an hour left, so we'll go on to a few audience questions, if anybody has any. So please raise your hands if you have any questions on the bring the microphone to you. to the 08 financial crisis, and I just wanted to ask uh, Mr. Hutton, uh, in regards to Keynesian theory, uh, what are your thoughts uh, that through government intervention, uh, the corrupt financial institutions that caused the crisis through their uh, over overexposure uh, resulted in them being in a state of imminent collapse, resulted in their bailout by governments so that they remained without punishment as the same corrupt financial institutions to be able to have the same power and perform the same actions again uh, in the near future. Um, I don't know if I can reply to that without the mic. Oh. No. <laughs> Athleticism of some. Oh! The super chair jumps six steps to get the mic to me quickly. Um, look, um, I think it is a disgrace that there's, uh, there's not been one um, successful um, conviction. Um, um, oh, any of the actors in this. Um, uh, it's a widely held view, actually, in British business, of British business, and actually British banking, you'll be surprised to learn. Uh, uh, um, the worst and uh, incredibly extravagant salaries and bonuses paid uh, in the run-up to 2008, you're right. Um, the incentive system was all, uh, was all skewed, wrong. Um, that was actually um, nothing to do with uh, all the regulation and what I've been describing. It was remuneration committees, uh, private organisations, uh, setting uh, incentives for executives voluntarily around what they thought was the goal of maximising share of value. Uh, it, was a, it was a private universe responding uh, to price signals uh, uh, where the underlying kind of assumptions were wholly wrong. Um, so, you know, um, what is what what said about its moral hazard? Uh, I mean, my, my pushback on my counter challenge to you is what would you have done in the September of 2008 had uh, I mean, Fred Goodwin, who was the chief executive of what was then called the Royal Bank of Scotland, which is now called Nat West, and it rang up um, the, uh, the Treasury at um, 3 o'clock in the afternoon and said, at this rate of withdrawal, um, uh, uh, in the internet markets, we, we simply won't have, we'll, we will have to declare a void, we simply won't have to keep our commitments. Uh, and actually, uh, a liquidity crisis was morphing into a solvency crisis. And if that West could meet its commitments, the cascade effect on the other clearing banks would have been uh, enormous. You know, the state could have found itself owning all the banks 
and under all the deposits and trying to head off the father and mother of slums. You know, your choice was, do we let these bastards pay the consequences for their actions, which actually we probably should do or would like to do, but the consequences for the economy and society in Britain will be absolutely devastating. And one of the reasons why and the uh, banks up close are so closely regulated is because you want to try and avoid that fundamental dilemma. Of course you keep a close eye on people because the externalities, the consequences of them kind of getting things wrong are so cataclysmic. That's why they're regulated, actually. And that's why regulation is so frequently a very good and important thing. It's the way that we assert ourselves, protecting ourselves against these kind of untoward actions of actors in private markets. But I mean, should there be kind of a more aggressive action to bring people to book? And um, the best of Fred Goodman, Fred Goodman is no longer a member of, I think, St. Andrews, he's lost his knighthood. He hasn't suffered any more than leaving the bank in the, in the way that he did. Um, it's not, it hasn't been good enough. And I know a former director of the general CBI is still privately fulminating about uh, the way in which uh, bankers got treated. In, uh, I have to say that one of the reasons why the banks stepped up to the plate as aggressively as they did uh, in the spring of 2020 and to get out uh, COVID loans to kind of try to underwrite British business in the way that they did was actually because they didn't want to be seen 10 years later to be part of the problem. And actually, uh, uh, I have noticed, I mean, I'm an enormous reader of banks, my book, The State Room, back in the day, put the uh, phase of the financial system at the center of my critique of the British economy. I have to say that I've really noticed a kind of change kind of in the attitude of, of, of British bankers in their relationship to British business, in their anxiety uh, to get things right going forward. So yeah, you are right, um, and I agree with part of what you say, but I, don't, I, I honestly couldn't have said, nor would anyone have said, let the British economy go down uh, so these people can face the consequences of their actions. Okay, well, yeah, I mean, I'm sort of slightly with well on the, my view of 2008 was I'm on the side from here, right? So the, you, you do have that sort of crisis, practical um, uh, emergency. I'm interested on the prosecution side. I, I, I really confess I don't know enough about it. I'm not a, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I don't actually know what are the possible crimes that, say, Fred Goodwin and others have committed. Uh, I mean, looking literally, you literally know which particular statute is it, or what common law offence is it? Because it does seem to me that we need to be specific on that. You know, generally tanking your business is not necessarily considered to be a criminal offence. People do that all the time. But uh, I agree, I don't think there's been sufficient payback. On the regulatory point, I mean, I think we, and this is where the point I didn't want to start from, we got into too big to fail. We got into a situation in which a bank went down like RBS, potentially the whole economy goes down with it. And in part, I'm not saying it's exclusively this, but in part this is because of an extraordinarily heavy regulatory burden. Uh, I, I know the guy who set up Metro Bank, I don't know if there's one in Cambridge, uh, yeah. uh, that's the first new retail banking operation since, I think, 1868. Um, this isn't a functioning market. Can you imagine if no department stores or pubs or restaurants had changed since 1868? you would be thinking something was going badly wrong in the marketplace. Every other area of retail activity has transformed monumentally. Companies going bust, new ones being set up morning, noon, and night. Nobody from 1868 would recognize the landscape. Retail banking, something seems to have gone spectacularly wrong. Virtually no new entrants in 150 years. Gobsmack. What do we put back down to? Uh, now, I think it's in part, uh, I mean, that I'm speaking to you from the analysis of Vernon Hill, that I set up Metro Bank. The regulatory burden of setting up a new bank is so colossal. I know some of you ran a very small bank and just said the regulatory burden is so I'm just going to sell out to one of the big guys. That you're likely to get just three, four, five, or six colossal banks dominating everything, and that is dangerous. So I go back to my earlier point that bank failure is what you want to make safe. You don't want banks to be safe. You want Fred Goodwin to go down his business and fails, but it's no different to any other company winding up. That's what you want to get to. And the moral hazard point that we'll uh, point you to, I think, is. Very great indeed. I don't know how you underwind, unwind this, but uh, I think if a, if a company goes down, a bank or anything else, the shareholders should take an absolute part if you lose your share. The government doesn't come and buy your shares, they fall to zero. Uh, I used to very foolishly have shares in Southampton Football Club because I'm a fan of Southampton Football Club. Went into administration. The government didn't give me my £5,000 back. I lost it. Um, uh, if you're a shareholder of a bank and you know, goes past, I get bailed out by the government or you work for a bank, uh, no wonder you get to see no banking. Uh, I spend a lot of my holidays in Las Vegas. I gamble quite a lot. I enjoy it. Uh, if I knew 
that the government is going to cover my losses at the poker table, I would be gambling in a very different way to me knowing, which I do at the moment, that all of the losses at that poker table are borne by me. Uh, so the shareholders need to take a bath when they come. They also need more bank failures, but they need to be safe. And I question the deposit insurance, actually. Uh, I think if you put your money in a financial vehicle, be that a bank or anything else, the default position is the risk is on you. Uh, if you, like me, decide to invest some of your money on a spin of a wheel in the Las Vegas casino, you don't expect the government to bail you out if it comes up black and you bet on red. Uh, if you have a share portfolio uh, and then the shares go down, the government doesn't bail you out because you made a bad investment. Why should the government bail you out for putting your money in, in a risky bank? I think my solution to get there would be to have one bank, now we nationalise so much of it, which is your national bank, backed by the government. Uh, if you want to put your savings into the Hutton State Socialist National Bank, you can put your savings in, and that is backed by the government, and all of your money will be protected. You will probably face interest rates of minus 5%. Um, you will have to pay for each check that you write or each time you use a, an ATM, but we'll back that. If, however, you wish to put your money in some other venture, I think that risk should fall on you, so we can transfer you into a state-secured operation. But that doesn't necessarily need to be the universal means. You can put your money in stocks, shares, Bitcoin, uh, a spin of the wheel on Las Vegas, and the burden of those losses are yours. If you want the safety and security, I'm willing to grant you the Will Hutton, Will Hutton Nationalised Socialist Bank with the United Kingdom to guarantee your savings up to 100,000. Uh, come back on that. <laughs> um, well, first of all, I don't recall um, advocating um, a socialist bank. Um, uh, uh, and it's a little bit like Boris Johnson on the floor of the House of Commons. Um, uh, anyway, I'm in favour of public banks, yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm pluralist. I like private, public banks and private banks. Um, look, um, this is exhibited in you know, a um, revealing way, actually, quite an important difference between Mark and I. Um, uh, the bulk of the UK population has extraordinary perfect knowledge. Nor has it got the time or the ability to find out whether Bank A or Bank B or Bank C uh, is actually um, going to be looked after this money. Uh, I, as it happens, am back with Nat West, or the Royal Bank of Scotland, as it was. Um, my wife, back with HSBC. Um, neither of us have taken the time um, to explore whether HSBC's balance sheets were stronger than the Royal Bank of Scotland. I had that West gone down, I would have lost my money in his world, and my wife would have retained part of hers, because HSBC was better run at the time. Uh, but I mean, the UK population, you can't ask, you can't ask the adult population of Britain, you know, 30 million of working age, and 10, 15 million of pension age, they can conduct the kind of search um, uh, that he is requiring you to take. Yes, of course, of course, if Mark goes gambling in Las Vegas, he should bear the consequences. But my daily quota to end life is not a bloody gamble in Las Vegas. I want the, I want the high street bank and I bank it, and where my money is paid for my weekly and monthly salary to be safe, and to be sure to be safe. And I look to the we, the public institutions, to do that on my behalf. And I elect representatives to the House of Commons to hold those institutions to account. That's why capitalism and democracy go hand in hand. We have to assert the we. And in a libertarian approach where you try to kind of absent it in a way that Mark described on deposit insurance is not a civilized approach, is not a, a societal friendly approach, and it allows people to suffer brute bad luck that they didn't deserve. The remarks I made at the very beginning. There's the fissure between his worldview and mine. I have apologize for calling you a socialist. Uh, <laughs> never call myself a socialist. Okay, okay. Keynesian, uh, we'll, yes. We'll, we'll call it the Will Hutton Keynesian study. Yeah. Yeah. I'm willing to grant you this institution. I'm just saying that you don't need to apply those institutional rules to all other decisions that individuals might want to make. That is on tap for you, your wife, or anybody else who wishes to invest in it, backed just as it is now by the government deposit insurance guarantee. But it needn't apply to other options that people might want to choose to invest in. So I'm not removing that option from you. I'm just not making it compulsory on any other bank. And I'd say another interesting thing that came in that first come out from this exchange of the difference uh, between Will and I. I am not claiming that every single person who banks with a bank has perfect knowledge about its balance sheet. Markets don't work in that way and don't need to. Let me give an example. 
I have absolutely no idea how a refrigerator works. No clue at all. I do not have a PhD in refrigeration. Uh, I don't know what the best bag brands of refrigerator are, but I'm very confident if I go into Argos and say, can you just please sell me a bog standard fridge, please? I will get a fridge that works. Uh, we don't all need to be experts in refrigerators for there to be a working market in refrigerators. You need a small number of people who are experts in it and price it, and a, and a reasonable number of people who are willing to switch. And the odd article in Rich Magazine about what's the best refrigerator, you don't need everybody to know how a car works, or how an aeroplane works, or how a refrigerator works, or how a computer works, in order to make a rational, sensible, market-led purchase about them. I've never had a clue uh, how a computer works. I go to Disney World and say, I basically wanted to do this. So all three options might take one, all of which are priced very similar. That's how markets work. Not that you have perfect information about everything at all the time. And they're comparing the balance sheet of NatWest or HSBC before you make a decision. Or are measuring every refrigerator in Argos before you decide which particular one to buy. You don't need everyone to have perfect information. Markets deliver very good results as long as there's enough information. You can actually be rationally ignorant. You're going around a supermarket, you don't necessarily know all the production standards behind everything, but you're confident enough of what you're purchasing. You don't need full and perfect knowledge. So I reckon I've got a solution here for the, uh, a bit of hardism and a bit of libertarianism. Well, then, I mean, I, I, you've got six minutes left. I don't know whether you want to. Well, we can, um, we'll go slightly over. We've got an extra five minutes. You can slot with me, Actually, I mean, um, I hope you're enjoying this, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I took a, I took a, uh, a job recently. I'm, I'm president of the Academy of Social Sciences. And economics is a great social science. And actually, because, uh, and Mark and I have strong differences, uh, as you know, which is but also great overlap. So I really uh, want to welcome you all um, to economics. Uh, and actually, not economics, so we do an adjacent social science. Um, it's where the action is. I just wanted to say that. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure Charles will say something. We do have a different too. I, think, I suspect we agree about social science. Yeah, you know, I think we could have got a nod. Yeah. Um, look, the point about this is that um, buying a refrigerator and, uh, and I'm watching all your savings are disarray are uh, uh, two different things, the, the order of magnitude of, of the calamity. Uh, if I buy a wrong fridge, too bad. Um, if my life savings are eliminated, I'm wiped out. And actually, you have to, there's some proportionality here. Uh, I'm not asking um, anyone, even as a piece of it is, actually, uh, all these products um, that you buy in supermarkets um, and buy in stores and high streets or buy online have some correct standards they're required to conform to. Um, uh, quite right, by the way. Um, so you do know that from the blow up and make you will or whatever. Um, and uh, a bag going wrong, I mean, it doesn't just make you, a uh, refrigerator consuming gases in the back might give you a funny turn, uh, get rid of it, put it in, put it in drive outside. If your back, if your settings go, you're going to go And consequently, um, the, that's why we um, banks are as closely regulated as they are. Um, it's why also the deposit insurance has to be, um, it can't just be, it has to be universal. It can't just be um, one bank may provide it, another bank may not. And, and actually, by the way, um, uh, the extent to which it's done to the tax system, or the way it's done by actually banks paying into a central levy, uh, that's a lot of kind of can of worms we can open up in the next three minutes. But um, uh, I'll rest the case for that. Okay, well, that will end the main uh, part of the debate. Uh, we'll just get to the conclusion from both of you about how optimistic are you for the UK economy. So, Mark, you can go uh, first this time, about uh, three, four minutes. Well, I'm very optimistic if we can develop a Hutton Littlewood coalition. I mean, uh, 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 no, I, I'm, I'm not very optimistic about the UK economy over the next 20 or 30 years. I said at the outset, I don't want to be a doomsayer about everything. Uh, I should say also, my advice to you, I agree with Will, please study economics and social sciences. I would also agree with Will's advice that you should probably think more about what you do with your life savings than what kind of fridge you buy. So if you're available time, but more effort and uh, investigation into where you put your life savings in the future than which fridge you buy. But you don't need to be perfect uh, about either. I'm not optimistic. I think we're probably just about going to muddle through. I suspect that's what's going to happen over the course of the first 15 or 20 years of your working life. Uh, I am expecting growth rates to be poor. Uh, uh, at a long term trajectory, of maybe 1%, 1.5% per annum, somewhere in that broad range, not the 25 3% that Will and I would be used to for much of our working lives. That's not disastrous, but it's disappointing. 
uh, I think that's less than this country can achieve. Uh, I'm expecting tax to remain at an extraordinary high level. I'm expecting the state and the public sector to have, if anything, an increased and increasing impact on our lives rather than a decreasing one. And I don't believe that that is a recipe for entrepreneurialism and growth. It doesn't mean I want to strangle the state in the bath, but it does mean I want it to be measurably smaller. I think if you want to see a really growing, thriving entrepreneurial economy, whilst you need the backstop for the state, it should probably account for something like 20, 25, 30% of GDP, something of that sort of order. That's what we've typically seen is associated with the fastest growing economies of the world, both today and historically. We're well into the 40s and no sign of reversing that trajectory. Uh, so I don't think disaster is going to happen. I don't think you face the apocalypse. I think many of the problems we face, we will solve. Uh, climate change and the rest, or satisfactorily ameliorate them. Uh, but I'm not particularly optimistic. I'm expecting a pretty dull, slightly grim average for the next 20 years. Well, um, I um, now I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be downbeat, but I'm going to be upbeat. Um, I I have a very kind of different view take on this uh, from Mark. Um, I, I think that the alchemy of a successful economy uh, is to try and get the right blend between an individual agency and markets and the dynamism of capitalism and to get the institutional structure right that supports that uh, and trying to blend the I and the we. Uh, uh, you know, the, the people who really go for we, we, we are actually the kind of social tradition, and the people who go for I, I, I are the libertarian tradition. And actually, uh, uh, both utopias lead, um, I think, to false outcomes. And here's the point. Uh, uh, as matters stand, uh, the British libertarian right uh, have been in control of the national conversation, our policy options, and actually have led us um, to the denouement where we currently are. Uh, Monetary Policy Committee Bank of England said that growth in 23 and 24 will be 1 percent. Um, uh, phenomenally disappointing. Phenomenally disappointing on trade, net trade. Phenomenally disappointing on our export performance is sort of languishing. Um, uh, our investment levels are indifferent. Um, uh, and we've excluded ourselves um, from what was our major market. Um, and there are 10 mark views at Dover uh, to get our stuff across the channel. Um, it's not a great situation. And I'm looking forward to uh, the potential implosion of the British Conservative Party and the thinking that's corrupted it uh, the last 40 years. And I'm looking forward to the possibility, to put it no more strongly than that, that actually this country uh, can actually get things right. And there's a lot of fantastic things to build on. When I started at my college in Oxford, I was introduced to uh, a chemist who founded a company called Nanopore. Uh, I went out to the Oxford Science Park. And by the way, there are hundreds of companies like this around Cambridge. It's Oxford and Cambridge, you know, we kind of play around with each other, competing at an amazing university. If you get to Cambridge, you've done bloody well. Um, but uh, Oxford's not bad either. Um, <laughs> uh, um, uh, this uh, chemist had devised a way of putting an electrical impulse through an uh, the nanocore, the molecular structure of your DNA, and the uh, construction machine that could read the shape of the electrical impulse as it passed through that, that nanocore, and could thus code your, gene, your, your, your DNA. And by genetic sequencing, you can actually, within 15 minutes, kind of tell you uh, what you're ill of, how you react to certain kinds of drug. And you wanted to build this company. I was very encouraging. Now, nanocore um, was voted for 4 billion. Uh, on the on, on AIM, uh, and it's employing over a thousand people. It's got operations in thirty in thirty countries, and it's going to be one of the astonishing med tech successes uh, of our times. There are hundreds of companies like that around Oxford, around Cambridge, around our better and stronger universities. If we could get the institutional structure right, if we get the, the flow of venture capital right, if we get the financial structures right, if we can regain access to the European single market by reframing the pathetic trade cooperation agreement that Boris Johnson signed. If we can actually get rid of the dread grip of this conservative framework and the libertarians on our national policy, and start actually to reframe the national conversation about how we really capture 
extraordinary dynamism that lies in these islands, we could do bloody well. So your future indeed doesn't have to be as dismal as Mark described it. If we can actually take the best of what Mark said and forget the rubbish, <laughs> and build on the kind of things I've been saying, <laughs> we'll break through. And we need you to come to Cambridge to say to your admitting tutors uh, how much you enjoyed this debate, not to make fundamental mistakes in your yeah. economic presentation, get into Cambridge and go on and make that happen in your careers in the future. Thank you very much.